Hello, my name is Vince Romo. The show that you're about to see is about barrio lifestyle, about being raised in the barrio, being from the barrio, the do's, the don'ts, the what's and the where's, the who's in the house. Thank you for tuning in. Welcome to Barrio Driven. Hello, today I'm here with Johnny from Barrio Del High out in Orange County. Thank you, Karna, for sitting with us today. Um, before we get started, if you want to give the audience a quick introduction of yourself, there you go. Uh, my name is Johnny. I was born and raised uh, in Del High, Barrio Del High community in uh, Orange County. And um, today we're going to be uh, talking a little bit about my story. I want to thank Vince, Hertz Media, for, um, for coming through and giving me this opportunity. Thank you, guys. The pleasure is ours, Kana. Thank you for sitting with us. So, thank you, Kana. As you know, once again, you're in the hot seat, which sometimes people don't want to sit there because we hit you guys heavy. This show is different than most podcasts, and that's something that, that we're very proud of. So, here we go, Kana. Johnny, tell me about your childhood, Kana. As I told you guys, you know, I was born and raised in the Dahai community. It's a little community inside of the city of Santa Ana. It's, a old, it's one of the old barrios in Santa Ana. And um, yeah, that's where I was born and raised with my siblings. My mother, she came from Jalisco. Yeah. And um, she had no clue. She had no idea about what um, the area she was moving to, to Dahai. She came straight from Jalisco to Dahai. She didn't know what the area was like, but um, that's that's where she raised her children, me and my brothers yeah. and my sisters. And um, inside of that neighborhood, inside of that barrio is where, you know, um, I got to experience, I got to live um, what the barrio life is about because there was a lot of things going on outside of my home. Inside of my home, there was a lot of love. Yeah. There was a lot of happiness. There was a lot of good memories, but once we stepped stepped outside of the house, it was a different story. What did you see outside the house as a child? Uh, there was drugs, there was gangs, there was violence. There was, um, you know, there was a lot of things going on that, you know, people don't want their kids to experience and go through. Yeah. But, you know, um, like I said, my mom had no clue or no idea about none of that, so. She basically left Jalisco and came here to give you guys a better life. Yeah, but, she she was raised in Jalisco. She was brought up poor. It was just her and my grandma. And um, they're always moving around from place to place because yeah. they were just trying to survive. And what about that? Where was that? Uh, my father was... I knew who my father was, but he was never really in the picture. Wow. He was out, out doing his own thing. My dad had um, children with three different women. Wow. So, you know, he was just out there doing what he was doing. So he never came to your house? He never, I mean, you didn't My have... dad lived 10 minutes away from us and he never came to see us. Wow. Yeah, it's like we didn't exist to him. Like the only time he came around was just to like drop off a little child support check every wow. month and that was it. How many times would you say that you actually got to sit with your father during your childhood, talk with your father? During my childhood? Something to eat with your father, anything like that. Yeah, during your childhood. During my childhood, it was a few times. It was a few times. I got to know him, I, I knew who he was, but he just never really made an effort to come spend any time. He never, you know, went to any of our school things, n never stopped by to check up on us and see how we were doing. I remember, you know, we would have the same clothes throughout the whole school year, like the same clothes all school year long. And yeah same shoes all ripped and messed up and like he never came to take care of us wow you know and me and my sister were the only ones who had the same father you know my brothers and my other little brother they had their own dad did it knowing that your father and you know please uh, we come with the most respect knowing that your father didn't really almost care you know he he kind of you know when when you're you got the same clothes all year long yeah when you know because with having the same clothes all year long and you're it's you're being neglected yep. you're going through it you know what i'm saying not only it, that you know you're showing up to school and you know 
be know, made fun of. You know, kids That's don't yeah. hold back. Yeah, you know, exactly. If if you look like you got some cheap shit on, kids are gonna tell you, "Hey, you got some cheap ass shoes on." You know, and I was yeah. wearing Payless shoes. You know, yeah. Um, I remember wearing coasters and pro wings and stuff like that. You know, wow. and it's like um, kids used to make fun of that, and I used to get into fights because of that. Yeah. You know, and later on, I started learning, you know, like, hey, you know, Reeboks are cool. Nikes yeah. are cool. Like, I'm first generation Mexican. Yeah. You know, my the first language that I spoke in my household was Spanish. Spanish. You know, and I think for, I think that's a pretty, like, a, a, that's pretty powerful. You know what I mean? For us living in America. Yeah. You know what I mean? Being um, born and raised here. Yeah. Like, my first language was Spanish. Wow. Because, like I said, I'm first generation. My mother came from Mexico and... Everything in our household was Mexican culture, traditions, morals. My mom was Catholic, you know what I mean? Yeah. So we were praying. Um, my mom didn't come with her by, on her own. She brought my grandma with her from Mexico. Oh, wow. So my grandma, while my mom was at work, my grandma used to take care of us. Well, she tried to. Yeah, tried to. You know, to. but my grandma didn't speak no English. She didn't have no job. She didn't do none of that. She was just staying home, taking care of us. But she was already older. Yeah. So while my mom was out working double shifts we were like we we're taking off you know we weren't even at home i was yeah. jumping on my bike i was riding my bike through the hood and experiencing and, and and um you know first things for the first time you know like the first time i smelled weed or the yeah. first time i seen someone slamming or yeah it was all right there in my neighborhood wow did it make you angry that dad is not around and did it make you know mom and this honestly mom is really not around that much not because she doesn't want to she has to provide for you exactly. she has to take care of you so do you think that that made you angry as a child it did i was a really angry wow. child very yeah. angry do you feel that that's what drove you to the neighborhood um, is that where, where when you seen this as a kid and and you saw the the, the homeboys the older homeboys from your water drill and you know you've seen all these things out, outside in your environment do you think that anger made you gravitate towards that lifestyle it did it did, but um, I didn't become from my neighborhood like out the gate. You know, there's there's homies who are born into it. Like they yeah. have dads, uncles, grandfathers yeah. that are from the barrio. Like yeah. my situation was different. You know, I had, I'm first generation, you know what I mean? So I didn't really get to know about the barrio till I started uh, having friends that yeah. were from the barrio, you know what I mean? Or yeah. their dads or their uncles, Yeah. you know? And then later on, that's what pulled me into the barrio. Were. You know what I'm saying? How old were you, Kana, when you got into your neighborhood? 17 years old. 17. Yeah. I was 17 years old, and by that time, I was already in and out of juvenile hall. Huh? Wow. What was the first time that you, you got busted for uh, going to juvie? The first time I was arrested, I was 14 years old, and it was for a strong arm robbery. Wow. Strong arm robbery at 14 years at old? At 14 years old. What, what happened that day? What made you do that? Uh, it, it goes back to, you know, like being angry and being poor. You know, I, I seen how my mom was struggling. I... I wanted to help her any way that I could, you know, even if it meant doing wrong. Wow. And, um, you know, at that time, you know, I'm young. I'm a, I'm a teenager, so, you know, when you're young and, um, you know, you want to you wanna keep up with everything that's going yes. on around you, you know. Yeah. I, wanted, I wanted some fly shoes. I wanted to look g up. Yeah. You know, so. You were yeah, willing to do whatever, whatever it took. Whatever it took, you, you know. Like so, to have those things. So, um. Tell you me know, about that I, day. I what exactly a, happened? I had a friend that had the same mentality as me, you know? And yeah. He was kind of like, he didn't have a father. And he had an older brother, like I did, that was from a, var a barrio too. Not, yeah. I have an older brother that's from a barrio, but not the barrio that I'm from. Yeah. You know, the barrio that my brother's from and my barrio, they're like, they're enemies. Wow. You know, so anyways, I had a friend that had an older brother just, just like I did. And yeah. so he watched everything his brother do. So we kind of like, Learn from our older brothers. Yes. And so his older brother at the time, that's what he did. He was, you know, he was strong arming people, you know, and he, he was like, hey man, we need to, you know, we need to come up, we need some money, yeah. whatever, like, let's go, let's go make some money, you know? So yeah. I just remember we grabbed some knives out. I went and I grabbed some knives out of my kitchen and we just started strolling around the neighborhood and the first Vato that we seen wearing jewelry, looking like he had something, we just hit him. Wow. You know, he was on a payphone and you know, I was I, I was a pretty um, I was a pretty I played sports when I was young. Yeah. So you know, I was I was in your, a regular fourteen year old. You know, I was yeah. already like ready to fight grown ready man. To go out, yeah. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So. So you had no fear. You had no fear. I didn't. Yeah. You know, and plus I had my two older brothers. And my my older brother used to rough me up a lot. 
You know what I'm saying? He was physical with me. And he was from a different barrio. He was from a different barrio. How did but, that happen? I mean, were you guys fighting all well, that because you're from, you guys no, are enemies? No, no. My brother, rigid, my brother was born and raised in my barrio. And yeah. he had friends from his generation, his age. And he was supposed to be from my barrio, you know what I mean? But something yeah. happened along the line where he bumped heads with guys his age or whatever. And he started hanging around with a, a certain uh, um, crowd. Yeah in my neighborhood yeah and um they used to all get along with the older guys and everything in my hood but later on that neighborhood those guys ended up going to another side of the city and they ended up starting their own neighborhood wow and little by little conflict yeah, started conflict, happening conflict, yeah you know yeah i won't get too deep into what 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 but yeah you know but it, there was it ended up causing a big war wow you know what i'm saying and would you and, say that? And while my brother was living, while we were living there in my barrio, my brother was already making enemies. In your neighborhood? From the guys his age from my neighborhood. Wow. You know, so. And you're sitting there, did, did anybody? But at this time, I'm not affiliated with nobody. Oh, okay. You know what so I'm saying? Still, yeah, yeah. I'm just watching my older brother do his thing as yeah. a gang member. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. And um, that's, where I, that's where I learned the gang culture from. From your carnal. From my older brother. Because um, when we were younger, it was all break dancing. Yeah. It was all DJ. You know, yeah. we were kids, you know, Beat Street. <laughs> and uh, yeah. we're, you know, we're cardboard doing backspins and all yeah. that. And that turned into party crews. Party crews turned into gangs. Yeah. You know, exactly. and I remember that's the little stage my brother went through. It was like break dancing, graffiti, DJing. Then he, little party crews, little flyer parties. Yeah. Que, hey, uh, you know, meet me over, uh, 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 meet me over here. You know, there yeah. used there used to be this older guy in Santa Ana. His name was Cheerios. Cheerios. You know what I mean? And uh, everybody used to go to him to find out where the party was. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. this guy would be like, "Oh, the party's over here. The party's over here." So, back in the day, flyer parties or whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? People. That's what was going what on. Was going on. But from going to all those parties and doing all of that, my brother started meeting dudes from. You know, neighborhoods. that weren't from my area yeah. and he ended up um making friends with other dudes you yeah. know and later on those dudes ended up starting this neighborhood, starting this neighborhood. That, where my brother was from wow so you got arrested for strong arm how long, how long were you, what did, they, did they give you for uh the first time that i was arrested they got gave me a year a i was year. 14 years old wow how, how mean? tell me about that time how was it being um, for the first time was it a culture shock to you were you like damn well, that's, you know, the reason why I brought up, you know, that was my first crime and all that, because that's how my criminal career started. started. When I committed that strong arm robbery at 14, that's when my career criminal started. And that's also when my, um, my journey through the institution, yeah. my life, institutional life started. Yeah. Because uh, they took me to juvenile hall. And then from there, you know, I had to face a judge. Yeah. And I experienced all this for the first time, and I didn't really understand it. They were using words and... Phrases that I didn't understand, didn't understand, you know, like, uh, um, you know, my public defender would be talking to me and telling me this and this and that. And I would pretend like I understood what was going yeah. on, but I really did not you know. Wow. So um, back then, like for it being my first case and me being 14 and having a clean record, I think a year was a long time. It was. Can I, yeah, you know I was surprised. I, mean? I didn't think you were going to say that. But but I think because, you know, um. Reality is reality. You know, yeah. I was a young Mexican man. I'm another statistic. Yeah. You know what I mean? They were going to hit me with the Make an example full punishment. You know what yes, I'm saying? exactly. Especially the area that I come from. Like, um, the law doesn't like my neighborhood. You know, I've yeah. had homies that got killed by, by Santa Ana PD, you know, like, and, um, since I was young, like just walking around, even before I had a criminal record, cops used to stop me. Gang unit used to stop me yeah. and search me. And I wasn't even on probation or gang terms, bro. They used to take off my shirt. Yeah. They used to do all that. And I would be like, hey, I'm not on probation. I'm not, I'm not a gang member. I'm not yeah. none of that. They would just be like, hey, shut up, turn around, take off your shirt. Yeah. You know, so I had to go through all that stuff even before I hit the system. Yeah. So I already knew the way that Santa Ana PD operated, especially in my neighborhood. Now, now being incarcerated being in juvenile hall for the year what did you see in there and there was nothing that made you say hey maybe i don't want to live this life you know you got we went away for a year yeah. exactly as you said you know and that was rough for the first time well out of the year i did i ended up doing 10 months <clears throat> okay you know they let they met, let me out two months before my yeah because i was like in there they had a, they sent me to a place called joplin okay. you know it's out in yeah. tribuco canyon in the hills <clears throat> Excuse me. and um 
while you're there, they, it's like behavior modification. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, if you behave, they give you privileges. Yeah, give you, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. So, you know, people get furloughs after a yeah. while and they come home and yeah, do this and that. And who's not going to want that? Of course. You're in there, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, come on, you dog. You're, you're a teenager and you yeah. have little females and yeah. your family and all that. So, you know, I was trying to do my best, even though I was getting into fights. Say, that's where I first experienced, you know, like, Hey, where you from? Where this? Where that? Like, yeah. what's up? That's it. Let's get down. Yeah. All that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. So I kind of like got my, I threw hands a lot in juvenile hall. Yeah. And um, that's kind of where I learned how to throw hands. Do you think that by you fighting a lot in juvenile home, it gave you a sense of like, hey, like, like puffed you up? Because you know, like, man, homie, you it know, did. this is where I, it did. It did. Exactly. And, and, and to tell you the truth, because like I had gotten in a couple of fights, like when I was in elementary, junior yeah. high, and, um, I used to get nervous before those fights. Yeah. I don't know if it's because I knew a bunch of people or whatever, people were gonna watch, watch or whatever, yeah. whatever. But uh, once I hit juvenile high, I just didn't care, bro. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like I was ready for anybody to confront me. You began to change. I began to change and I started getting sucked into more and more into that lifestyle. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like like the badass fool, you know, like yeah. the, like, like so you a career that? criminal, like yeah. a career criminal, you know, like, and all that comes with that. Is that what you, Wanted to be good. When I was young, I did. I remember I used to be in the driveway talking to my homies and we used to be talking about how we were all going to be pinteros and, yeah. you know, we were going to be in the pinta and all this stuff, yeah. you know, and like we seen our older homies and we'd be yeah. like, I'm, I'm going to have a big old brocha and I'm going to be combing yeah. it with my palm comb. Yeah. And we thought... You looked up to them. We thought that's what it was. We thought what that's what the lifestyle was. That's, we thought that, you know, that's how you earn respect. That's how you... You found the somebody. Asset or not. Yeah. So after one year of getting out, what happened when you went out? Like when you got out here, like when you came back? Uh, after the first time that I got out, I, um, you know, I thought it was a joke. They put me on gang terms, and I yeah. thought it was a joke. And the first thing I started doing was smoking weed and drinking and hanging around with the homies that lived on my street. Yeah. And uh, I was only out for like a week. A week? Like for a week. A week? After man. doing 10 months, yeah, as a 14-year-old. You know, and um, they gave me like a four or five month violation and I went to YGC, which is another juvenile hall facility that's yeah. right here in Santa Ana. Yeah. And I did a little four or five month violation there and then I got out again. And then after that, you know, I, it's safe to I didn't learn till I was 32, bro. Wow. I didn't stop till I was 32. Wow. So but actually, you know, I, I paroled in in 2010 and i discharged my number in 2014. so from let me say this can i so, so from, from 14 years old all the way almost 20 like years. from 94 to 2014 pretty much i was in the system you were out there you were active you were you know out there I mean? you were this is what you were doing i was in the system wow you know tell me your first serious charge um well i mean well first that was my was, first, first one was charge. serious charge yeah yeah i was a strong arm robbery you know? I, I meant, um, and and and, yeah. and to elaborate on that yeah that was my first serious charge and it was in 94 and it's when pete wilson implemented the two strike law yeah. so i just barely missed that and yeah. i didn't get trialed in this adult yeah i still got trialed as a juvenile yeah. because here in orange county they trial you as an adult at the age of 14. well when i said serious charge i meant as an adult so let me as think that, yeah, as an adult. My first serious charge as an adult. Well, I mean, I went to prison the first time for robbery, too. Robbery again. You know what I mean? Tell me what happened that night. I want to go into details. You know, what happened that night that you're, you're continuing doing this? You know what I'm saying? You're, as talking to you, I see that that's, you, that's what you've been doing. If I were to ask you how many people in your life, Kana, that you actually, you could say that, you know, whether you put a strap to them, whether you put... A, a, a knife to them, whatever the case may be, that you've actually robbed these people. How many, what's the number? How I many don't remember, bro. Wow, that many, Kernan? I don't remember. Is it safe to say that that's how you were living for yourself? I was living like that. Wow. You know, and that's why right now I'm a two striker. I have six gun charges. Wow. You know, I've been in and out of the system since I was 14. I stopped at 32. And it's all because of that. L let me ask you, Kernan, as you said that you know, when it comes to, to the straps, where you, it never came to your, your thought, or it actually, it, I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't think it, it did. I think that it's safe to say that you held that strap and you were proud to hold it and you would have took some, somebody's life, am I right? I mean, at, honestly, the drop, the I, if you had to. Honestly, like I, my intentions were never to kill nobody yeah. with me having guns. 
That's well, you not, would have, am I right? If, if I have to defend to. myself, I, I mean, I've had to defend myself. Of course. You know what I'm saying? You're from Obarga, of course. Exactly, you know what I mean? And um, I'm not going to let somebody just take my life that easy. Of course, of course. You know, I'd rather go do 10, 15, 20 years or something before somebody takes my life like that. Because I feel my life holds way too much value. Of course, and it does. It does. You know what I mean? And, and it's only because and of And I'd rather be alive. Here. I'd rather be alive doing life than dead. And, you know, my family's in pain. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's not because I'm a badass or anything like that. That's not what I live for. That's not what I live for. That's not what I want out of life. Yeah. Obviously, now I'm doing different things with my life. Of course. But when I was stuck in that state of in mind. state of mind. I was ready to do whatever I had to do. And I, me, and I wouldn't have hesitated to do it. Tell me about that state of mind. If you could tell me exactly yeah. what it is when you're living in that lifestyle, currently being incarcerated over and over. So let me ask, how many years would you say you've been in the system? Well, from 94, from 94 to 2014, whatever that is, 94, 2000, let's see, How 94. many years though, like total? I'm gonna say like over half of my life, you know? Yeah, mommy, over half of your life. Yeah. And how old are you now? I'm 44. So half of your life you've been well, incarcerated. I, I, I'm, I, I don't know what the math is on that, but it's probably like half of my life. Half of bro. your life. Good. So you, you were a career criminal. Kid. I was. Tell me about the mindset that puts you to be able to be a career criminal, that you're robbing people, you're strapped up, only you, know, only you and God knows what you did with that strap. As you said that, hey, you would have took somebody's life in a heartbeat if you had to, to protect, and also you're gonna protect your life, you know what I'm saying? Because you have enemies. I wanna know, I want the people at home to know the mindset of someone that's living that life. How would you describe the mindset and who the, and the person that you were at one time? Well, you know, on top of the anger, on top of the poverty, yeah. on top of the gang culture, um, from the age of 15 to the age of 20, I was also a heroin addict. Wow. You know, a lot of people don't know that about me, and this is the first time I ever shared this you know, how did you become a heroin addict? Uh, the, it was part of my environment. Wow. It was it was there. What was the how old were you when you, you started shooting up? Right? I didn't. I never shot up. Never I never shot, shot up. up. Never put a needle ever in my arm. Wow. I used to smoke it out of foil. I used wow. to smoke it from foil. Wow. You know, and um, it was introduced to me because, like I said, you know, um, my barrio, the area I grew up with, was saturated with, with narcotics, with drugs. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And um, I remember somebody once told me, you know what I mean? Hey, you know? Try this. Smoking weed, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? This is like, thing, it's the same thing. same thing as Yeska, dog. You know what I mean? mean? No, it isn't. And when in reality, you know what I mean? You both know that it's yeah, not. Of course. You know what I mean? Of course. Heroin is addicting. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like marijuana, you can smoke weed, wake up the next day, it's whatever. You can stop yeah. smoking it. Exactly. But once you're addicted to heroin, it's like, you gotta keep smoking. You gotta, I had to keep smoking it. You so it was one of your older homeboys that introduced you? No, it wasn't none of my older homeboys. It was, it was the homies, my peers. Yeah. We were a bunch of like little 14, 15 year olds riding around in our bikes all loaded on heroin. Wow. You know? So you and, started that. And, and people, started people used to see us and think we're just kids going to the park to play football. But we're really, we're all loaded on heroin on our bikes, bro. Wow. You know what I'm saying? And we were, we're doing, we're committing crimes. How you know, we're breaking we into cars. We're fucking stealing stereos. We're robbing stores. We're whatever. Yeah. You know, to, to feed our addiction. Yeah. How long, how long were you addicted to heroin? From 15 to 20. 15 to 20. From the age of 15 to the age of 20. Wow. And you did anything at that point to get that high? Let's be honest, can I? Well, even though and I was addicted, did. there were still things that I wouldn't do. Dog. Like I wouldn't, I wasn't burning my family. Yeah, well, yeah. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't stealing from people that I cared about and love. I wasn't yeah. breaking into my neighbor's house. You know, yeah. I still had morals. You know, I still have standards. I still would crease my pants and be g'd up. That's right. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't like a sloppy, like you know, like that a lot way. of people call them like tecatos. Yeah. You know what I'm saying like I wasn't a sloppy tecato that was just you know. I didn't even consider myself a Tecato because I'm just 15 years old. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Once I started to realize what I was doing to myself and what it was doing to me, that's when I left it alone. Did your family, did your mom notice a change in you? They did. And that's part of the reason why I stopped. You know what I mean? I would be, I would be sick all night long. My, and me and my brother, we shared a room, my, one of my older brothers, and he would have to be massaging my back and... 
you know, because the sickness would hit me hard. I would be shaking and shit. Yeah. And Tell us about that. What did you, what did your body go through? <sighs> it, it, exactly, word for word. It's like knows. it's like hell inside of your body. I mean, one minute you're hot and like you feel like you gotta have be like cold, like you have to refresh yourself. Yeah. Then the next minute you feel like you're cold and you just want to be in the hot shower. And um, I don't know, everybody probably feels different, but like sweets, like sweets used to help me, like eating, yeah. eating M&Ms, like Skittles, yeah. Snickers, like, you know, like yeah. I would just be drinking like sweet stuff, like Gatorade, Kool-Aid, like, yeah. I don't know, that's what heroin, that's what, that's how, what heroin wants, you know? Yeah. yeah. So that's what I used to be doing, you know what I'm saying? I wouldn't even be eating like full meals and then, um, it would constipate you really bad. So like when I would use the restroom, man, it, it would be painful. Wow. You know what I'm saying? And I never, I, I never knew anything about this drug. It just came into my life and it just, it just, it was, it was poison. It was straight up poison. Yeah. Yeah. It is. But because of that drug, I, I did a lot of things that, you know, that I regret, you know, I like was what, high, man? Like, like, like the robberies, yeah, you the know, robberies. like, like, um, the way that I was making money, it wasn't in a, respectable way you know most kids you know most teenagers they're 15 16 they'll get a job like at you know the dollar tree or walmart yeah. or you know the movies or yeah like i wasn't doing any of those things tell me tell me one robbery that you did that still resonates with you this day that you know like damn i can't believe i did that like i want to know Kana, what's the one just and you know i'm sure you have it that you actually really, really regret? I mean, I really don't want to talk about that, that one because I was never caught for it, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. I was never caught for that one, but um, somebody got really hurt yeah. during that one. And um, uh, I just wish that person wouldn't have got hurt. Yeah. I wish I could have just, you know, took the money and that was it. Lim, do you have regrets, Fina? Yeah, I do. All the time I do, cause I think I reflect a lot. I reflect a lot, and I think a lot yeah. about the things that I did. A lot Especially of when I'm in my neighborhood, because yeah. a lot of those memories are there. Yeah, that's where all those things happen. Exactly. And um, there's a lot of things that I regret. There's times where I wish I wouldn't have went somewhere, or, or you know, I didn't run into this person, or I wish I wouldn't have hurt this person. Yeah. You know, but. You know, the reality is, is I'm human, you know, and I'm a, I'm a born sinner, you know what I'm exactly, saying? And exactly. Regardless of how perfect I try to be or, or, or try to be, like, I'm always going to fail. I'm always going to come short, you know what I'm saying? Because I'm not God, you know what of I'm saying? Of course. Do you suffer, most of us and most of the people that I've interviewed, including myself, do you suffer from PTSD? Because, you know, when we live a certain way, when we live a certain way, we live a certain lifestyle, it always comes back to us. And we constantly think, um, like, I don't know more, thank God, but many times I used to have trouble sleeping because my mind would be going. You know what I'm saying? As you said, that you're always constantly thinking. Do you ever think about it when it's just you alone? Like, man, the things you've done in your life, like, you can't take them back. Not only What's the things that I've done, done, but also the things that I've seen. Like, because well, there, there's things the that I've seen that, that I didn't do, but I've seen them, you know? What's the worst thing that you see, Gernon? Uh, i seen a dude hang himself in Wasco and that said, Wow. You know, and the correction, uh, he was a, he was on, I was on the second tier. He was yeah. on the bottom tier beneath me, below on the bottom tier. And um, I remember I seen him ripping sheets up, you know, yeah. and uh, planning the whole thing, you know what I mean? I remember he got up on his vent and he started tying the sheet on his vent. Yeah. And then uh, I just remember he fucking put the sheet around his neck and he threw himself off of the top bunk wow. and snapped his own neck and hung himself. And I remember, um, you know, the, the, the med units and the SEALs coming in and they, uh, with the gurney and they, they took him out of the cell already all purple, you know, like yeah. he, he was dead, you know. And later on the SEAL came and told us that the guy died and he was like, why didn't you guys scream and tell us anything, you know? Yeah. But you know, you know, in there, man, yeah. the, the game exactly. is silence. You know exactly. what I mean? Exactly. So whether somebody is, you know, killing someone or some somebody's taking their own life or somebody's doing whatever, you just got to act like you don't see nothing. 
Yeah. You know, and, and uh, believe it or not, that does something to you. Of course it does. You know what I mean? Because does. in another situation, I would have probably tried to help, help that, that guy. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? But because that's part of what's going on, part of the program, you know, I just had to sit there and watch that. Sit there and watch this man suffer when you could Pretty much just take his life, you know? Yeah. And For you, whatever reason that he was going through, whatever, you know? And, um, yeah, man, that was, that, was, that was something that I seen that, you know, like... That haunts you. Am I right? It just, uh, you know, like, from, from one minute you see somebody and then boom, boom, the next minute they're gone like that. And it's like, yeah, you know, it makes you think, you know? It does make you think, or not. It does make you think. Yeah. What was the, you, you're a two-striker. I'm a two-striker. So that means, um, for those that may not know, I mean, I'm sure you probably do, but there may be some, you know, because we get people watching all over, all over the world. Tell them exactly what a two-striker is. Well, here in the state of California, they have laws. And, um, you know, one, one of the laws that they have here is that if you commit violent acts, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, for each violent act that you commit, they could, um, they could put a strike on your record. Mm -hmm. So if you commit a violent act, it, uh, it's a strike. You know what I'm saying? You get three strikes. And uh, after the third strike, they pretty much give you life in prison. Your life for exactly. So, what was the first strike for? My first strike was for um, for a firearm, and it was a, a I had assaulted somebody. Yeah. But they didn't pick up the assault. Somebody reported me after I so I assaulted them. Yeah. But when they found me, they found me with the firearm. With the firearm. So they just charged me with the with firearm, firearm, not with the actual assault with, with the, the assault. firearm. Yeah. But that was the first time that I, that I was, you know, I got struck out for that. Tell me a little bit about prison. Well, I hit prison the first time when I was, I believe, 18, about to turn 19. Yeah. I was 19 years old the first time I hit prison. And I had just gotten out of camp for a gun charge. I had just did 15 months in camp for a gun charge, and I was out maybe for a few months, five, seven months. And, um, yeah, I, I ended up getting busted. Trial, you know, I was already an adult. I was 18. And I went to prison for the first time, and I just seen, uh, you know, I mean, it wasn't... What'd you see, Bernard? It was a man's world. Yeah. It was a man's world, and I was still a teenager. Wow. You know, so, you know, regular 18, 19-year-olds, they're... You know, they're still it, not mature. Is it okay to say that, that maybe you were maybe a little bit afraid at all? Were you a little bit like, was it a culture shock to you? A like part of that? me, a part of me was afraid, but a part of me wasn't because I already went through the juvenile hall system, you know? Yeah. So I was like, what's the worst else that could happen? You know, I was already throwing blows with fools. Yeah. In my mind, I was thinking, all right, the only thing that's going to be worse now is that there's shanks involved, you know? Yeah. So I would think about that, you know? But once I got there... You know, it's like I, I seen what it was, you know what I mean? And I seen how, how the homies get down and how there's a program and how it's kind of like the military. Yeah. You know, it's um, it's very disciplined, you know, and yes. especially for us that are Mexicans from yeah. Southern California. Yeah. It's like a lot is expected from us. Yeah. So, you know, I didn't know anything about this. You know what I'm saying? So once I got in there, it's like that's what it was. It was like boot camp. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and exactly. I, I started, you know, it's my little school, right? it is, you know, and I started my little program and little things started happening. You know, I started getting involved in prison riots and I started hitting ad seg. You know, uh, later on, I hit the shoot program and I just pretty much whatever prison is, I got to see what it is you know, me, to the full extent of it. Tell me about about the shoe. Well, the shoe is the shoe is just a. Uh, the, sh the shoe's a world, a whole different world, yeah. you know? Yeah. The shoe is a whole different world. Like, we're out, we're out here living our lives, and um, meanwhile, inside of the shoe, there's people who, who are just, like, on a whole different mind, mental level. And, um, you know, when, when you say the word... Um, uh, like survival, when you say the word, um, um, 
solitary yeah like that's what the shoe is yeah it's solitary and it's survival wow being being in there would you say that there's a lot of um it really messes up someone mentally it does because you yes. don't have too much interaction with people i know yeah exactly you know like i was in there and um you know yard time was like like what yard time you know what i'm saying like yeah. you're going out for like 30 minutes every like two weeks you know what yeah. i mean or yeah if you're lucky you're going out every week for 30 minutes but it's not like that even mm -hmm. showers showers you don't get a shower every day you yeah. know you get sometimes you don't even get showers the whole week you know you're bird bathing for a week straight out of a little yeah. sink you know yeah. like just with a little cup throwing water on yourself you know would you, would, is it safe to say that being by yourself for 23 hours a day or whatever the case may be yeah. and hardly getting out you know maybe once a week would you say that that messed you up mentally for them? Well, honestly i'm gonna say honestly i think it just made me a stronger person wow wow because i went through something that i probably thought that i couldn't go through and yeah. once i went through it I, I feel like it made me a stronger person but while i was going through it it was difficult it was hard it was difficult yeah you know because it really made me reflect on everything on everything and even being in there cannot be in the shoe you I, did you start to have regrets at that point did you start to say man you know what i'm i've been in the shoe two times yeah uh the first time i went to old corcoran and yeah. that was on my that was the second that was my second term in prison yeah. i've been to prison four times so my second time to prison i went to old corcoran shoe yeah you know, and I was there for a year. Yeah. And that time, I was, is when I was 18, 19 years old. The yeah. second time that I went to the shoe, I believe I was like 26 years old. And that time was a little, the, my second time in the shoe was a little bit different. Tell us what was different. It was different because the first time I was in the shoe, like I was young and, yeah. you know, I still had my brother. I still had my family and my life yeah. the second time that i went to the shoe it's like um i had my brother passed away while i was serving five years i'm sorry to hear that um sorry and to hear that. and he was a lifer in prison my brother wow. you know he um from you know living in my neighborhood and the little situation that i told you that you know he became from another hood yeah he ended up catching a life sentence because of his neighborhood and yeah. all that stuff you know yeah and um what did he get incarcerated for? For, for life? attempted murder. Attempted murder. Yeah, my brother was locked up for attempted murder. And they gave him 30 years to life. And he was in prison and he, when he passed away. And correct? while I was serving my five years in prison, prison, my brother passed away. What happened to him? My brother's life got cut short because um, he was, uh, without saying too much, you know, he was, he was involved in the lifestyle in there, you know? Yeah. And... Um, he ended up losing his life for what he believed in. So they took his life? Yeah. I'm not sorry. not the inmates. Yeah. The correction officers did. I'm sorry to hear that. Kind yeah. Of, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, but, um, you know, my brother believed in what he believed in. And, you know, this lifestyle, this gang lifestyle and all that, that, you know, a lot of people try growing up in and being a part of, like, um, like my brother really lived it to the fullest. To the fullest. You know what I'm saying? Does it knowing that your brother's life was taken by by the correctional officers now today does do you have a lot of anger for that do you have any anger for the law enforcement do you have is it even safe to say that you have hate for them because they took your brother from you you're never able to talk to him he's gone he's gone and he was murdered yeah and he was taken away does that bring anger or hate towards honestly when i lost my brother i was in tehachapi state prison yeah and um the the reason how i ended up catching a shoe is because when i got the news that my brother passed away um i remember going into the tv area and um and uh i was in the tv area by myself and um and uh uh, uh A brother, you know, yeah, a, moreno, a moreno from Long Beach approached me and he kind of like came at me a little sideways and um, I let my emotions take over and you know what I mean? Um, yeah. What I happened to that? I ended up taking off on that guy, you know what I mean? And because uh, I took off on him, 
all the homies started taking off on, on everybody and it caused a whole a whole riot in the prison on the yard that I was on. Wow. And I uh, ended up getting a shoe for inciting a riot. But um, it was kind of a blessing in disguise because w when I went to the shoe, you know, they gave me my time and I was in there by myself and I was dealing with the death of my brother. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, they don't give you too much literature, too many things in, 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 yeah. in, in, when you're in the hole or in the shoe, you know? Yeah. And one of the few, very few things they do give you is a Bible. Yes. And when I was there, um, I had never really like tripped on the Bible or anything like that. I believe in God and you know, my mom's religious, she's Catholic, but I've never really like opened up the Bible and read it. Yeah. And uh, while I was there in the shoe, I read the Bible, you know, from front to back. Wow. And then I felt like it spoke to me. I felt like God spoke to me. What did he say to you? I, I, um, not to be angry. Wow. Because my brother was in a better place now and he didn't have to suffer. Wow, that's heavy. You know, that's and heavy, um, my brother knew God as well. Yeah. You know, there was, there was a part of his incarceration where he used to send the scriptures. Wow. And he was going to church and he was searching for hope. You yeah. know, that one day maybe he would come out. He would come home. And my mom, my mom never lost hope and faith. You know, she always was hopeful that one day her oldest son would come home. Come home. And, you know, he never did. Yeah. But, you know, when that happened, it kind of like brought peace to me because... Like, I was living when my brother was suffering. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I was in there in the system. I was in and out of the yeah. system. So I knew what the system was like. And like, honestly, to spend your whole life doing that shit. Yeah, I understand. Like, honestly, like, not, not to be like that, but even I'd rather not be, spend the rest of my life there like that, you know? If you could go back in time, Kernan, and make a choice, to get into your barrio, to do all the things that she did, would you go back or not and say, man, I don't want to live this life? Or would you stay, or would you say, hey, this is what was handed to me, this is what I would do? Or would you actually, as I said, do things different if you were able to, Kernan? You know, I don't have to go back into time to do that because I'm still alive and I can make those choices and decisions right now. That's right, Kernan. As a man, That's you know, right. when I was young, I didn't have no guidance. Yeah. When I was young, I didn't have a father figure. Yeah. Uh, I didn't have nobody there to, to a. Hey, you know what? If you're fucking up, I'ma fuck you up. Yeah. You know there wasn't yeah. nobody there. There was no discipline. Yeah. You know I didn't understand it. Now that I'm a man, like it's different. You know, like I know those things are wrong. Yeah. I know that you know doing drugs will lead you down the wrong path. Not only because. I've experienced them, yeah. but because I've seen what it's done to people that I love and care about, my peers. Exactly. You know, and um, so, now at this age, you know, I yeah. could go back to smoking heroin. Yeah, I could go course. back to robbing fools. You know what I mean? And probably even do it even better now because I'm experienced and got the knowledge to do it. Yeah. And I could probably, you know, but why am I going to do that for? I know that I'm going to be slowly destroying myself. You know, I'd rather give back to the place that I took from. I'd yeah. rather give back to my community. So let me ask you, Kernan, you know, you're a veterano from your barrio. Mm -hmm. you, if there was a youngster, and this is one of the questions that I like to ask, you know, everybody. If there was a youngster that came up to you and said, hey, homie, you know what? I'm going to go out, homie. I'm going to go put in work for the water, homie. I'm going to take a fool's life. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, homies. What would you tell him, Kernan? I'd tell him, hey, if, if uh, you're ready to do life in prison and never never ever feel a woman again or never yeah. kiss a woman again or never eat your mom's home cooked meals again or never know what it's like to just get up one day get ready and go out and enjoy the day yeah. and have nobody dictating your life or telling you what to do then ponle yeah you know what i mean but if i were you i'd think about it because that's what's going to happen if you get caught yeah you know what i'm saying yeah you ain't never going to see daylight again there's not going to be no more handball with the homies there's not going to be no more hey, i'm going to go chill with my hyena yeah. You know, there's not going to be no more like, hey, uh, we're having a little party for my little brother or sister, you know? That's like, gone. I, all that shit's gone. There's no more color. All the color's gone, homie. All you're going to see is black, white, and gray, and that's it, concrete. That's heavy. Girl. You know, you ain't going to see no more grass at the park. You ain't going to see no more fucking, hey, okay, I'm going to go to the taco, you yeah. know, we'll grab some tacos and shit. You're going to be sloppy-ass food, you know what I mean? Whatever they yeah. want to feed you. Wow. You know, being incarcerated for so many years, Karnam, you have a lot of ink on you. Yeah. Can you show us some, Karnam? Yeah. Say more. All right. So we're with Johnny showing a, a few of his tats. As you guys already know, he's done half his life incarcerated in the system. 
two striker and being incarcerated he has a lot of he has a lot of ink on him um what do you have right here can i what is this well um first of all i didn't get none of this ink when i was incarcerated okay. i never wanted to get ink while i was incarcerated wow. because i always understood you know what i mean that yeah. you're getting very low quality in there wow. you know what i'm saying yeah. so i always throughout the whole time I did time, I always told myself that if I ever was to get ink, yeah. that I was going to come out here and I was going to go to a shop and get ink. And you did. And I did, but still with the same story that I carry, you know what I mean? Yeah. What, so, is, what, what is this right here? This right here is a, it's a tattoo that I got of a female with horns, a snake tongue, and no eyeballs, meaning like she has no soul because um, I've been in three serious relationships in my life. Yeah. And um. There's hurt there. There's hurt there, and it's, it's caused pain. That's they, why they weren't healthy it. relationships because of the type of person that I was. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't put no blame on the females. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. they did what they had to do. You know what I mean? Because they didn't want to be with a person like me. Exactly. You know what I mean? And I don't blame them for that. Yeah. You know, so. So you have regrets. So from... love. This is what love has been to me. You know, this is this is my story of what love has been to me, and how I viewed the fem the females who have been in my life, or just females. I can't say all females in general because obviously my mother's has a beautiful heart and she's yeah. a female, you know? So I know not all females are like this, but this is what it's been for me. Let me ask you, Kunal, being incarcerated so long and being institutionalized, do you think that that affected the way you treated these women or the way they viewed them? It affected the, the way in the relationship? It did. And also part of me coming up without both of my parents, you know, yeah. I never really got to see the way, you know, a husband treats his wife or yeah. or the way my, my father treats my mother, you know? Yeah. And, or having my father telling me, look, man, respect your mother. Yeah. Like you respect women, you yes. know, like I never had that. Wow. So I kind of had to learn that the hard way, wow. you know? Um, what, what else do you have on here? What is this? Uh, this is a tattoo that I got of death because when I was 17 years old, um, one of my close friends, he died in my arms. We we're at a house party and um, he ended up getting shot shot in the eye and he, wow. he bled to death and died in my arms. So you saw that? I saw that. And he was 17? He was 18, I was 18. 17. What's it, what was his name? His name was Tony. Tony for um, if his family No, he, he, he wasn't from Avarro, you know, and I wasn't yeah. from Avarro yet when it happened. But it He's happened still. at a house party in my wow. barrio, wow. you know what I mean? We still want to send our regards if the family did see this. Um, what else do you have, Kunal? Um, I have a picture right here of Satan. Uh, of what, Satan? Of Satan, yeah. Wow, of Satan. Of Satan, yeah, Lucifer. Because- What, what uh, made you get that, Kunal? Honestly, I don't believe in Satan. And I mean, I don't, like, you know, I'm not a devil worshiper. Yeah. But I know there's a spiritual warfare going on. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I know that he's a big part of it. I know he's the reason why I started doing heroin. Wow. I know he's the yeah. reason why I started robbing people. Yes. I know he's the reason why my brother caught a life sentence. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So whether I like it or not, he's been a been a part of my life. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I didn't put him on there because of to glorify him, but you know, just like he's been a part of my life, so has this person watching over me. Wow. Jesus Christ. And that's Jesus. Yes. So you have you, know? you have Jesus and you have Satan. And I have Satan. Because you gotta remember there was a time even where Satan was tempting Jesus. Yes. And he was trying to get him to sin. Yes. For 40 days, 40 nights in the yes. desert. Yes. You know, and Jesus went through that and he allowed Satan yeah. to yeah. to do that. God allowed Satan to tempt his son. Yeah. You know? So you just how God allows that. Satan to tempt us, you know? So because you we're 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 um we're born with free will. Exactly. No. I always tell people, you know, one of the things that I tell everybody is the two greatest gifts that God has ever gave, gave us was the first, Jesus, the son. Second was free will. So as you know that, that Satan is there. Yep. And so you know that he is the one that... That's a reminder to me, you know, wow, when funny. I look at that, uh, I know he exists. I know he's out there ready for me to slip at any time. Yeah. You know, if I need some heroin, he's going to get it for me. Wow. If I need a gun, he's going to get it for me. If I need a kill, he's going to be there with me. He's going to be there with you. You know what I mean? But just like how I'm right here in my life right now, making changes in my life, he's here with me. And he's always been here with me. Wow. You know, through all of that. Wow. And, you know, this is the Archangel Michael, you know, slaying demons. Yes. Which is like, you know, I got to face demons every day. 
You know what I'm saying? I fight my demons every day, bro. Even though I'm not an addict no more, even yeah. though I'm not active. Yeah. You know, there's I'm still facing demons every day that are trying to pull me back into the lifestyle. It, it, so it, it is safe to say that you have that battle within you. you every have day. That struggle. Every day. You know, wow. I'm human. Yeah, you're human. I still get angry. Of course. I still think about the lifestyle that I grew up in. Yeah. You know, that's not going to ever go away. Never go away. These tattoos are never going to go away. What I feel in my heart is never going to go away. My brother's never going to come back. Right. Uh, my two strikes are never going away. They're never going away. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, I mean, I can't deny that stuff. I can't act like it didn't happen. Yeah. Then these are reminders that it did happen. Yeah. Does you know what it, I'm saying? Does it ever, this may sound crazy, does it ever give you like, like strength when you see the person that says he's right there to go and do something wrong does it ever give you strength and say nah i ain't gonna give in to you i'm not gonna give in yeah to because you. when i look at him i know he's ready to just laugh at me and you know watch me fail again yeah you yeah. know and i don't like being laughed at wow. i don't like to fail you know i was born to be a winner that's right that's right Kernan. what you see you have some lips on you what what does that represent Kernan? wow if you notice next to those lips you notice what it says next to it Ain't no love. Ain't no love. Do you believe that there's no love? My mother's proof that there is love. Yeah. God is proof that there is love. Yeah. You know, I believe there's love. There's love when you look for love in the right places. Wow. You know, if you try to go find love in the wrong place, you're not going to find love. You know, wow. like, like, like where I grew up, you know, that's not love. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? That's you're just hurting yourself. It's just yeah. pain and you're you're trying to figure out a way to live with that pain. You're trying to figure out a way to make it through that struggle when you're in the barrio. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's talking to you. I I hear I hear a lot of pain from the loss of your brother. I hear a lot of pain from relationship wise because with having a female with no soul on you and having some lips that says, ain't no love. The love that you were hoping to get from a woman, you haven't been able to get it. And it's affected you, I see, because that's what you want. You want a woman to love It affected you me at one point. Yeah. But the love that God and my mother have given me have been sufficient for me to carry on. Yeah. To where the point where I don't feel like I need a female yeah. to, to feel love yeah. or to experience love. Yeah. And most people, they look, they do look for love in that. Yeah. You know, they think that they need another person to make them feel happy yeah. or, or feel love or whatnot. And that's not the case. Yeah. You know, you got to learn how to love yourself first. Exactly. You know, and I learned how to love myself first when I was alone in the shoe. Wow. When there was nobody there to hug me and kiss me and tell me like, hey, your brother's gone, but it's going to be okay. You wow. know, I had, to, I had to hold myself. Wow. You know, that's heavy. That's heavy. That's heavy. What else do you have on here? Can I, what, what is uh, this says Orange County across my chest. It was my first tattoo. I got it when I was 17 years old. Yeah. Um, my homeboy Crook gave it to me. He was, he was fresh out of YA. He, he paroled with his little property. He had like a little shoe box and he had his little gun. And one day we were kicking it in his garage. And hey man, I still have my tattoo gun. The homies were there, you know, yeah. hey, tied us up. Tied us up. You know, and we're in the garage getting blasted up, you know? Exactly, representing where you're from. And uh, it, that tattoo means a lot to me because my homeboy, my homeboy Crook, you know, he's, he's, he's he, um, he was a good friend of mine during my childhood, you know, yeah. and because of this lifestyle or whatever, you know, he didn't pass away, but he had to leave, you know, and he's, yeah. I haven't seen him since we we're young. And one thing that I haven't asked you, do you have any kids? I don't have no kids. And that's because you've been incarcerated half your life. Yeah, um, that's one of the I've, reasons. I've had the opportunity to have two children. Um, the first one, I got my girlfriend pregnant when she was, when we were teenagers, I was 15. Yeah. And she had a miscarriage. And then uh, later on in life, when I paroled um, from one of my terms, I got a girl pregnant and she had a, a, a abortion behind my back. Sorry to hear that, Grenada. You know, so if that. not right now, what I had like, a, Two, two, two children, you know? Do you want kids? I do. I do because I, I think my mother deserves that. Yeah, yeah. I think my mother deserves to kiss and hold her grandkids. And I think if those babies were ever to be born, they deserve the love that a grandmother like my mom would give them. Yeah. But I don't know if that'll ever happen because, you know? I understand. I, I'm, 
I'm like really not too focused on starting relationships and stuff like that because I'm so focused on still trying to get my life together. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm 44 years old, but I'm not a homeowner. You know, yeah. I I don't have I don't really have nothing to show for my 44 years except exactly. the the things that I've that I've done, you know, which were not great things yeah. or honorable things. Yeah. So right now, you know, I've been clean and sober since I've paroled. I haven't drank no alcohol for going on three years. Wow. Um, when I paroled, I went back to college and I got my bachelor's degree. Wow. And I jumped into the electrical field. So I'm an electrician. I work in construction. And with that money and that income that I'm able to generate, I, I put that money back into my passion, which is music. Yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm a hip hop artist, a rap artist. Yeah. I'm independent. And um, for making music, I started a merch, a clothing line, which yeah. is called Gutter Made. And um, that's what keeps me grounded and keeps me keeps focused today is like, I want, I'm hung, I'm hungry for success. for success. I'm hungry to fix all the things that I did wrong in my life yeah. and try to make them right now. And part of why I'm doing that is because I want my younger homies to see that, that it's possible, you know? I want not only them, but people who live in this lifestyle and people who are like me, yeah. I want them to know that that life's not just about that, man. Like you have another opportunity to yeah. do something else with your life. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And it's a struggle and it's not easy, but it's possible. Anything is possible. Yeah. We are going to be going to a few places. We're going to go to your barrio. Yeah. As you know, we do on Body Driven. Mm -hmm. On Body Driven, we go to every person that we were blessed to interview. We go to the neighborhood. We walk around. I want to know, I want to go to the places that that hit heavy here, Kana. Yeah. I also want to go to places that bring you joy, Kana. And at the end of this interview, we're also going to go to the studio and hear a little bit of music from you, Kana. Appreciate that, man. You know? Um, where are the places you're taking us to? Well, I'm going to take you guys to the first place where um, I committed my first crime, yeah. that strong arm robbery. Yeah. The reason I'm taking you there is because that's where my criminal career started. Yeah. You know, I'm going to take you there. I'm going to take you to my childhood home where I grew up. Yeah. You know, and I had a lot of good memories and a lot of bad memories there yeah. with m my loved ones. And yeah. um, I'm gonna take you to the elementary school yeah. where, where I went to school, where, it, where music was introduced to me. Introduced to you. Because uh, while I was at that elementary, I was a part of the choir yeah. and I also played the saxophone. I was a part of band. Wow. And I feel like those two things um, were very important things in my life yeah. that helped me later on in my life change because yeah. that music stuck with me, that, yeah. that love and passion for music, yeah. I held on to that. And then finally, the fourth place I'll take you guys is to the park, you know, where I used to play as a kid, you know what okay. I mean? That's the park that's in my barrio. In your barrio. Yeah. That's it, familia. We're gonna go to Water Dalheim. Here we go. So right now we're with Johnny's mom, Maria. Maria, gracias for having us in your home. And, and this beautiful woman, she actually made us pozole. For those that know what pozole is, oh my gosh, it's amazing. Not just any pozole, the best pozole. You, you heard it from the man himself. Um, but before we, we sit down and, and eat, I want to ask you, Maria, your son has been incarcerated half his life. Half, half of his life, he's been gone. Yeah. How um, how do you feel knowing that you have one son that, that is gone? Your other son has spent half his life, and he's doing good now, but half his life being institutionalized. What pain did that heart, did it cause you? What heartache has it caused you, the choices that your sons have made? Very hard. Tell us. Very hard. I don't want to get em emotional, but... It's okay. You know? It's okay. It's very hard, you know, that I lost my son, my other son. Yeah. But I'm very proud of Johnny because he's doing great now. Yeah. He changed, so I'm happy for him. Yeah. You know, but uh, that was very hard for me. Your son is a two striker, which means if he does one more crime, he's going to be gone for life. I, and, I, and you'll never see him again. I understand. What would that do to you if that happened? Broke my heart. Yeah? Yeah. What does Johnny mean to you? My kids are everything for me. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I have, my kids. Yeah. So if, you know, he, he does something wrong and he go back, it's like, 
I don't know what to do without him. Do you worry that he's going to go back? No. No? No. Why? I trust him because he's been doing really good. Wow. 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 Thank God for that, Maria. Your prayers work because you see that your son is changing. And we at Body Driven are very proud of him as well. And thank you for agreeing to talk to us for a few minutes. If there was one thing that that has caused you the most pain besides losing your son, when it comes to Johnny, what is it? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Que, 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 que es el dolor más grande que yo ha causado porque yo ha sido como yo ha sido pues estar alejado ya estar lejos de mí yeah. eso es muy duro muy doloroso yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. she said that that's what's been more difficult is me being away from her Wow, wow. Do you, how do you feel, Kana, the pain that you've caused your mom, the pain that you've caused this woman who has only loved you? What does that make you feel like, Kana? Because you know, you have caused her pain. I'm sure many nights she has cried for you, cried on her knees, probably screamed for you. I, I know, she's, I, I, we lived it, we lived it. Yeah. Me and her both know, we, me and my mom know what we've lived. Yeah. You know? What does that make you feel? Does that ever like uh, hit your heart and say, "Man"? I mean, a part of a big part of me does feel like I I let her down at one point. Yeah. But then a big part of me also feels like I'm doing everything in my power to make it right. To now. do good now. You know. Wow. And um, that's why I make the choices and the decisions, and I live the way I live now to today. You know. And yeah. It's like when I was younger. What other people used to say mattered to me. Now I don't care. That's right. The only thing that matters to me now is like what has God told me to do while I'm here on this earth. Yeah. And, and what my mom has told me to do and showed me. It's family. And that's what matters to me the most. Yeah. You know, and that's what I'm living for now. That's and, right. And, and my little brother. That's right. You know, because it's me, my mom, and my little brother. And that's the only support system I have. Is, is your brother, your little canalito, is he from Guadalajara? No. My little brother has Down syndrome. Wow, okay. So, you know, we, we take care of him. That's right. That's right. That's right. You know, and um, he's, a, he's another big part of a reason why, you know, I, I made a lot of um, changes changes in my life, yeah. you know, because, you know, I understand life. You know, I understand yeah. we're not here forever. Yeah, you know? exactly. And it's like, he's my little brother, not my brother's keeper. That's right. So if it ever came down to, you know, like, I have to take care of my brother, I'm going to take care of my brother. Exactly. If I have to take care of my mother, if I can, I'm gonna take care of my mother. That's right. You know, and that's what I'm living for. That's what that's what my life is about now. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. Gracias, señora, por todo. Okay. Dios bendiga. We're gonna eat a little bit of the amazing pozole, and then we're headed to Eduardo. This is about the river. So right now. Johnny is taking us to his childhood home. As we're driving over there to where you were raised, where you have the memories of, you know, with your with your fita, with your siblings, your brother who's no longer here, your sister, just just the whole familia. What is going through your head right now, Kana? Um, just preparing myself to, you know, get ready to talk about stuff that I've already been through and Sometimes when you talk to things that you've already been through, you know, it kind of takes you back. What What are some of the things that you've been through, Kana, at your childhood home? Um, well, at my childhood home is where I was exposed pretty much to everything that has to do with barrio lifestyle. Yeah. You know, the, the gangs, the drugs, the violence, the crime, all of that stuff, you know, the struggle, poverty, what was the worst thing that you witnessed at your childhood home out there in that area? Probably the the thing that I um, witnessed. Yes. That was the most difficult was watching my family break apart. 
Wow. You know, watching my brothers and sisters become addicted to drugs as well. Watching my sister, you know, be a teen mom. She got pregnant at, at 14, 15 years old. Yeah. You know, uh, watching my mother, you know what I mean? Working double shifts and me never really getting to see her and because she was always working and we were raising ourselves. That was difficult, man. It wasn't, it wasn't no shootings. It wasn't none of that. You know, that stuff was normal to me. Wow. You know, the, the hard part was watching how my family suffered. So you're, which we didn't know, your sisters, your brother, they, they were also, what were they dealing with? What were they battling? You said with drug abuse. Um, what were some of the drugs that they were? Methamphetamine. Meth. Um, you know, even my brother, when he was incarcerated, he was addicted to heroin. And, um, and was it your sister that was addicted to meth? Uh, my sister, I can't really, you know, I never really asked if she was addicted. I, I never really seen signs that she was addicted, but I know she, she was experimenting with it. With it. But um, I think her, because she was a teen mom and she was, a, you know, she got pregnant at a young age. She changed her life once she started having her children. How, how is she doing now? Oh, my, my sister's... My sister's one of the reasons why I've changed my life as well, you know? Really? My sister went back to, to school to be a, a, a dental assistant. And in my family, nobody had really pursued education like that until my sister stepped up and did it. Yeah. And I think when she stepped up to do it, it motivated me and it influenced me to later on in life, you know, um, pursue my college That you were able education. to do it too. Yeah, because I seen her do it. Yeah. And we came from the same household. We came from the same struggles. So how, how was it seeing her being a teen mom? And how old was she when she had a... Uh, I believe she was 15 years old oh, when she had her first old. baby. Did you, with my niece. Did you get angry at that time with the individual that she was with? Uh, I, was, I was really angry when I found out she started dating, even before really? she became pregnant. Because uh, even though I was her younger brother, uh, I looked at myself like I was a father figure to her because she was the only sister and daughter in the household. She yeah. was the only girl in the house. So me and my brothers, we protected my sister. We didn't allow my sister to do a lot of the things that we were doing. Even though I was younger than her, I yeah. was still getting in fights with boyfriends yeah, guys, yeah. of hers her age, you know? Yeah. I was 15 fighting guys that were 18 because I didn't like them for my sister. Do you, let me ask you, at that time, do you feel that you, you failed your sister because she went and she got, she got pregnant? Um, I don't feel like I failed her. I feel like our father failed her. Well, that's heavy. You know, that's because heavy. Um, it's a father's job yes. to show their daughter what love is all about. Yes. They say that a, a, a little girl's first true love is her father. Wow, that's heavy. And um, my, 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 my sister loved my father with all her heart, but he just didn't return the love. Yeah. You know, he wasn't there to to teach her the way a man should treat a woman. He wasn't there to give her good advice and to do none of that. So my sister at a young age, you know, she, she started dating and, you know, she, my sister just like us, you know, my, my mom was always working and my grandma was too old to really control yeah. us or tell yeah. us what to do. My sister was, you know, leaving the house with her friends. My sister was popular. Yeah. My sister was like the most popular girl in school. She was like one of the prettiest girls in the neighborhood. Yeah. So other girls envied her. And, you know, my sister went through her struggles as well. And um, when she ended up pregnant at a young age, I, I was real upset, you know, but, you know, once my little niece was here, you know, all those feelings turned into love, you know? Did, um, is she still with the, the father of, of your no. niece or no? He's no. gone, so he's not in the picture. No, he, he um, he was kind of like like how my dad was, you know, like... He didn't care. Only when he wanted to, he'd show up and stuff like that, you know, and it's it, it kind of sucks for my nieces because my nieces, they're, they're beautiful people, man. Yeah. You know, like we raised them to be uh, smart, yeah. loving, independent, you know, so, women with morals, and that's what they are today. Is it safe to say, Gunnar, that there's maybe a little bit of anger for for your niece's father? Um, this is my childhood home. Should I park in the street or in the plaza? Wherever you want. Okay, this is it right here? This corner house right here. Uh, this corner house right yeah. here? Um, we could go into the plaza and then come out. Okay. Or como quieran. I could also park right here in the water, in the street. I see you got your barrio 
tagged up right there on the oh, wall. Well, because we that, got it right there, right on your childhood home at the bottom. My home is no. It says used to live in this house, you know. So we have. You see, uh, yeah, we want to get all that. We, you got your body all tagged up all over your, right there on your home, yep. your childhood and, home. And it was always like that. Who lives there now? Um, I have no idea, but um, sometimes I pass by and I see a, fa a happy family there. Yeah. And it makes me happy because, you know, I picture that's what my family should have been like. You know, my family should have been a happy family, enjoying that little house on the corner. And now uh, this little plaza we're in is the plaza yes. where I would run to get my mom tortillas and milk and to get everything that she needed for the, the house. This this little plaza right here brings back a lot of memories. So right now which is in the heart of his body right here. If you look, you see his body is tagged right here, right on the, the smaller wall. You got his body tagged up on the little sign right here. His body is, is all over. Even across the street, his body is all tagged up. So this is the heart of your body right here. This is it. Uh, I wouldn't say it's the heart of my body, but this is uh, definitely where in my body right now. Right now. Uh, my body, it's a pretty big, It's it, Dalai is a pretty big neighborhood. You know, there's a lot of territory. Yeah. It's a, a lot of homes that stretch from streets to streets to streets. Yeah. It's pretty much from, you know, we go from, from Dyer, it goes up to Edinger, then you go all the way to Grand, to Main Street, and pretty much this is all the heart of my water. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's not just one little small location, it's the whole neighborhood. Yeah. And one thing that, you know, sometimes we talk about, well, not sometimes, we do pretty much in every episode, is coming out here, you know, when we were eating some pozole, he told me, he goes, hey, Karna, I want you to be on your toes, you know? And why is that, Karna, that you would tell me that? Uh, because, you know, it's it's like like any other neighborhood, you know? Yeah. Neighborhoods have enemies. Yeah. There's things, there's real shit going on out here. Exactly. You know, shit that I have no power over yeah. and I can't control. Exactly. You know, so I wouldn't want to put you or bring you here and tell you that it's all dandy, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, same it is a risk coming out here. Yeah, of course. You know what I mean? I have a spade on my shirt. Yeah. I have a spade on my hat. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, people know what that means. People know. People know that. You know, that, so. Exactly. It, it's a part of me. It's something that I can't change. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's always going to be a part of me. Exactly. You know, it doesn't mean that I'm out here doing the things that I was doing when I was 15 yeah. or 16. I'm a grown man now at 44. Yeah. But you know what I mean? I'm, I'm, my mindset is different. Yeah. So, you know, I ain't out here doing these things, but that doesn't mean that there's other people there is other people out here with the mindset that I had at 15 and 16. Yeah, exactly. That was so, our life in a minute. In a minute. Anyone's. In a what, minute, in a heartbeat. What, what is... What is your worst memory and your best memory here at this childhood home? Uh, like what I was telling you guys on the way up here, you know, my worst memory is watching my family break apart. Yeah. You know, w watching my family that, you know, in this household, there was so much love. There was so much... Um, Laughter, there's so many good memories. Yeah. But once we stepped outside of this house, it was the complete opposite. Yeah. There was chaos. There was there was evil out here on, on these streets. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. And uh it was ready to consume me. Consume me. And it did. And it did. It did. Your best memory here. My best memory is also, you know what I mean? Like like my family, you know, like family. Uh, my little brother and my niece. Yeah. My nieces were born in this house. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um that's something, you know what I mean, that that um wow. that I'll cherish forever. So they were born I mean, in this house. They got to experience a little yeah. of what we got to experience. Yeah. But they didn't see really no bad. Yeah. But when we tell the story, they could confirm it because they were here. Because they were here. You know what I'm saying? Before we go to your, to our next location, the fondest memory of you and your brother, the, your brother that's passed away, the one that is gone now. Oh, what is yeah. your fondest memory of just you two guys uh, here? My brother used to love lowriders. Okay. He, used to, he had a 63 Impala. Yeah. And it was the first time I had ever seen a 63 Impala yeah. or been inside one, but he used to watch that car right here on the on the front yard and he, he used to let me hit the switches on it. <laughs> so because of that, I have a forever love for low riding. Yeah. I have a forever love for classic cars. Yeah. You know, and it's something that um even even today I find myself, uh, you know, I wanna get a classic car and I wanna fix it up because right. uh 
to let my brother's memory live on. It's something he loved that was positive. You know what I'm saying? Um, Also, when we were walking up here, Johnny had mentioned that right across the street, we can't go there because it's all blocked off. Yeah, there's construction going on. There's construction across the street. But I want you to tell us what exactly happened across the street that you mentioned it to us as we're walking. You said that something happened there that uh, that forever changed your life that you, you'll you never forget. What happened there, Johnny? Well, that's where I lost my, 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 um, one of my good childhood friends. His name was Tony. He was 18 years old and we went to a house party there that night and he ended up getting shot and killed and he ended up dying in my arms. Wow. And that happened right here down the street from my childhood home, like three, four houses away. Wow. And it's uh, something, you know, that even till today, I always think about it. I pray for him. I pray for his family. And, you know, part of the reason why I live my life the way that I do is because I know Tony didn't have the opportunity to live out his life. And I did, you know, so I could at least make changes in my life, you know, and um, do something good with my life, not just throw my life away. Because then it would be like my friend threw his life away for no reason. What were um, what were the last things that you told him before he passed? As you he know, passed away in your arms, right? I just told him to be strong, to fight. Yeah. You know, but my words weren't enough for him to fight for his life because, you know, the serious of the gunshot wound, it, it's ultimately what took his life. You know what I'm saying? It, yeah. I, I held him and I tried to talk to him and I tried to get him to fight for his life, but. You know? What's the last thing he told you? He didn't say nothing. He didn't say nothing. No, he, he was fighting for his life. That's all I could tell. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed that as we're out here and you guys can't see this, all eyes are on us. We're seeing cars pass by and they're, they're looking at us like, who, who are we, you know? And exactly as he said, we do take a risk out here, you know? And uh, God willing, God will always protect us. Um, where's the next location that we're going to, Kuna? Um, the next location that we're going to, it's going to be the elementary that I went to, but okay. right next to the elementary is also the park where I grew up playing as a kid, okay. which is Delhi Park. Delhi Park. Yeah. We're in Barrio Delhi. This is Barrio Griffin. Wow. So you live right here at the corner house and you were mentioning that at the corner house got a lot of attention. Yep. Let me ask you this. Back then, during that time, drive-bys were allowed at that time, years ago. There was drive-bys going on. How many times do you think that house was shot at? It was shot at at least five times. Wow. And never got hit? Uh, nobody ever got hit. Wow. Wow. But, you know, there was bullet holes uh, on the it, house. Yeah, on your home. You know, those bullet holes that hit other, or my neighbor's houses. Yeah. And... You know, those were real experiences. What did your jefita say at that time? What did she tell you? She was just scared, man, because, um, you know, it was something that we hadn't experienced or ever went through. Yeah. So, you know, the only thing my mom could say or the only way she could react was with fear, you know, fear for yeah. us, fear that something was gonna happen to one of us. You know, when we were talking to your mom and she started to cry, and I'm sure that that causes you, I'm sure that causes you some, you know, pain or emotion or something. Um, I don't think you'll ever go back to prison, Gunnar. I don't think you ever will. I think after talking to your mom, and I don't think, I don't even think if a situation arrives, I think that, I think you truly are past that, Gunnar. That you are that different person and you're not willing to, to live without your family because you know your family needs you. Am I correct? You're absolutely right. But at the same time, you know, you never know what's going to happen. You know, and, uh, um, you know, I just pray and I just hope that, you know, I mean, God is with me at all times because he knows my heart and he knows the desires of my heart and he knows my intentions are not the same as they were when I was younger. Let me ask you, Karnam. If something ever happened to your mom, because we know nobody lives forever. 
something ever happened to your mom or your or your canon would you say well fuck it I ain't got nothing to live for anymore I'm just gonna live however I want to do you think that that would come back do you think that old Johnny that old person that was filled with that anger rage you think he would come back I thought about that a lot and you know what I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to disrespect my mom's memory in that way. Yeah. Because she's worked too hard and we went through too much for me to go backwards. Wow. You know, I've worked too hard to um, be at where I'm at right now. And, um, you know, the, the way things are right now, and I see the joy in my mom's eyes. I see how yeah. happy she is that, you know, I'm finally doing something positive in my life. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? I, I, I would want to keep it the same and honor that. That's right. That's right. Wow, girl. Let's go. Right now, we're in, in his water room, Dow High Park. The park is named after his water room. Basically, you know, this is it, this is their hood. As we're walking up, a few of his homeboys, you know, as you saw earlier, you know, um, came up on us. You know, if uh, they, if I was somebody that, let me ask you a question. If I was here alone, looking the way I look, what do you think would happen, Colonel? You'd get approached. Right away, huh? Right away. Right away. You'd get approached and you'd, ask, you'd be asked where you're from, who you are, yeah. and what are you doing here? Yeah, exactly. Um, and if I came up with the wrong answer, I can't, I can't really, I don't know what happened next, you yeah. know? Yeah. But, but it anything be good. could happen, yeah, you it know? It wouldn't be good. Yeah, it wouldn't be good. I don't um, recommend it. I don't recommend you come here if you don't belong here. Yeah, exactly. Um, let me ask you a question, Kana. As an older homeboy, you know, we saw a couple of the youngsters, which I'm sure you love, you know what I'm saying? And I, 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 I saw the love that they showed towards you too. How would you feel, Kana, if one of these youngsters as I said, you know, uh, earlier, if we came back a week, a month, a year from now, and they weren't here, how would you feel, Colonel? Um, it would break my heart. It would break my heart because I see these guys like my little brothers. They are. Yeah, just like any brother, you know what I mean? Like he would want the best for his little brother, but, you know, I also understand that, you know, like uh, big brothers make their choices and decisions and little brothers make their choices and decisions, you know? One doesn't control the other, so. Do you, you know. do you feel it's your responsibility to to direct these youngsters because they look up to you in a positive direction, or do you feel that you should just like, hey, it is what it is? I feel like it's the responsibility of the people who are in their household, you know. But I also understand that not everybody has that yeah. in their household, so they come looking for it out here. Yeah, and um. You know, when you when you step out of your household, you know, in your household, there's love, there's pure, there's genuine love. Yeah. Not all the time from everybody that's in the house. You know, like me, my love, the purest love comes from my mother. Yeah. You know, I know once I step outside of my house, I'm not gonna find the love like that. Yeah. I'm not gonna find that kind of love. But this is the second best thing next to it. At least for me, it was. Yeah. You know, Let's um. Let me let me ask you a question. Like right across the street, your body was blasted real. We'll, we'll get in a little bit. Blasted really big on that wall. All, all the years that you were incarcerated, all the things that you've done, because you you're doing good in your life, but you also done a lot of bad, kind of. Was for your barrio, for your barrio, and for yourself. And you mentioned earlier that you do have regrets. What's, what's your biggest regret apart from your brother being taken that had to, because of course you love your barrio. You love your barrio, you love, you love them, you love your homeboys. But what is your biggest regret Kanan, about this right here, about your neighborhood, about your barrio that we're standing in currently? What is it, Kana? Is it because, you know, homeboy that was lost? It was all the years that you were incarcerated? It was, is, is it that, you know what, um, maybe misguidance to the youngsters? 
maybe you know what is it because you've given a lot to to your barrio you've given a lot to this carnal this is your barrio and you know the same mi barrio es primera yep. you know which means your barrio comes first yep. and you lived that for many years you know you've given your blood your sweat your tears for this right here for i'm still here. giving it you're still giving it i'm still giving it but not in the same way you know yeah i'm still giving it but the energy has shifted. Yeah. The energy has changed in a different direction. But have you died for your body on the before? Yeah, I mean this is this is why this is why you join. This yeah. is this is why you become a part of this. Yeah. Because you're willing to make those sacrifices. Yeah. You know? But another sacrificing that I'm making now is that I'm coming out here and I'm showing yeah. you guys that this is where I'm from. This is where I was born and raised. And you know, some people give their life to Christ, some people just stop gangbanging, some people stop being from their hood. I didn't do any of that. I'm still from this hood. Yeah. This is where I'm born and raised. I can't change that. Yeah. But I'm changing my behavior. Yeah. I'm changing my decisions. I'm changing the choices I make, the people that I surround myself with. Yeah. You know, I'm making the choice to not be a drug addict no more. That's right. I'm I made the choice to not rob people and yeah. And you know, I'm not out here you know, running around uh, causing destruction. Yeah. You know, and I'm allowing my homies to see me change, do good in my different walk now. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't come over here preaching to them and telling them they need to do this or do that. Yeah. But they see with their own eyes what I'm doing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So you're more of a being an example than I'm not saying you're not telling because I'm sure you are because I, I, I hear you and I've heard the way you, you've talked during our interview, but it's more of let me show you, then rather tell yeah, you. You could tell people anything you want. I could tell people this, this, that. But if my actions don't back up my words, then there's no meaning there. Yeah. There's nothing really there to be like, all right, I believe what you're saying. Yeah. But, you know, I'm demonstrating with my actions, so I don't really got to say much. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't got to come over here and give them a big old story about why they should do this or this or that. They know me. They know what I went through. And now they see what I'm doing. Yeah. You know what I mean? And not too many homies are doing that. Yeah, exactly. You know what I'm saying? Because this this right here is uh, something that a lot of people can't walk away from. Yeah. Uh, this is something that a lot of people don't outgrow. There's vatos who are your age and my age yeah. who are still doing the things they were doing when they're 13, 14, 15 years exactly. old. Exactly. You know what I mean? There's one thing you said right now that, that caught me. You said there's vatos that can't walk away, even our age. Can you walk away? Because there's one thing you said, you said you're still in your barrio. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That you're still here. Can you walk away? Can if you I walk wanted away to, if I wanted to, I could. Yeah. But the thing is that I made the decision, the decision not to walk away. Because you know, God doesn't put you in places where there's uh, um where everything's all good yeah. and everything's all easy. Yeah. You know, God puts his true soldiers yeah. in situations where there's destruction where there's yeah. chaos where there's sin yeah you know what i'm saying and a lot of the vatos that 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 do give their life to god and all that like they don't want nothing to do with the barrio no more yeah they don't want to come back to the barrio no more they want to forget about this that's heavy you know what i'm saying but people who really do want to make an impact and a change they're gonna stay right here homie they're gonna stay, they're gonna stay right here in the war zone wow because this is where it matters the most wow you know it doesn't matter once you're saved or once you know you made it out yeah you know it matters when these fools are right here and they're caught up. Wow. You know, but I'm not gonna be here telling them what they need to do. I'm just gonna be me and they, they could see it for themselves. Wow. Because I am one of them. Exactly. You are. Wow, Kanam. That was heavy, Kanam. Gracias for having us in your barrio. Yeah. Let's continue, Kanam. Where are we going to next? Uh, next we're gonna go, um, I'm just gonna take you guys uh, real quick by the elementary where I went to. It's where I learned music. It's where um, I was a part of choir and band. And because of that, now later on in my uh, adult life, I'm pursuing music. Something that I love and something that I'm passionate about. Something that's helped me direct my life in another direction. Yes. This is why you're driven.
So right here, this was your childhood school right here. Yeah, this was my childhood elementary. This is where uh, this is where music, I was introduced to music. Right here? Right here at this elementary. You had mentioned that you were introduced to choir, gospel music. I was in choir here, and I was also in band. I played the saxophone. Wow. From kinder to fifth grade. Really? Yes. So you went from choir to basically a, a life of destruction. Yep. Basically. Wow. Tell us about this place. Tell us, Gernon. Well, you know, um, this is where I met a lot of my childhood friends. This is where I was introduced to the people that were a part of this neighborhood. You know, the the kids who had the, the dads and the uncles yeah. and the grandfathers from the hood, you know? And, yeah. um, this is where I started learning about where I live. Were you ever, were you ever jealous or ever, you know, of, of friends that had fathers? Um, you know what, I was never jealous. So right now, we're driving to the studio. Um, yes, sir. But before we arrived there, where we passed by, we noticed uh, a lot of people out and about. A lot of people sure. that looked like they were, like they were addicted to something. I mean, let's just be real. They looked like they were homeless. They looked like that. And then you said, oh yeah, there's a lot of people that are tweaked out out here. Yeah. And you started telling us that when you were younger, you used to see people slamming right in front of you. They used to see, I mean, what what kind of, I mean, what, what, what did you see there? What, what, what is over there where you passed by? Well, um, the elementary school where I where I took you guys, it's um no uh, the homeless shelter where we were passing by. Right, it's um the elementary school that I went to. It's Monroe Elementary. Yes. And right next to Monroe Elementary, there's an army base. Uh, uh, that army base shelters homeless people in the city, and you know, uh, we all know what comes with homelessness. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's a lot of homeless people that you know they're not just homeless because they don't have nowhere to live. There's a lot of them that are homeless because they're drug addicts. Yeah. You know, a lot of them are fresh out of prison and institutions. You know, some of them got kicked out of um, halfway homes and stuff like yeah. that. You know, so that shelter is right next to an elementary school, that's which crazy. is in my neighborhood. Why would they, I mean, that's ridiculous. That's the city of Santa Ana I was gonna for say you. that, the city would put a homeless shelter that's the city right of Santa next Santa to an Ana elementary you. school. Not even a high school, an you elementary. Know, and uh, you know, so a lot of those homeless people, when they need to get high or they're getting high, there's also a bike trail that's on the other side of the elementary school. Yeah. So, you know, they'll go and when I was young, you know, I mean, the first time I ever seen a, a, a dope addict, a, a dope fiend slam was while I was playing outside uh, um, during PE in elementary in the bike trail. How old were you when you saw that? I was probably like eight years old, Damn. like seven crazy. or eight years old. Yep. Wow. At seven or eight years old. You're seeing someone slam right in front of you. Right shoot in front up, of you. Shoot up heroin, yo. Yep. That's crazy, man. They they used to have like um they used to put like mattresses out or, yeah. or stuff like that where they could kick it. Yeah. And uh yeah, right in the bike trail because you know um the bike trail is between uh two streets, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's between Warner and it's between Central. Yeah. So they have all that little space in between to hide out and do yeah. what they gotta do. And um, you know, it's it's right where the elementary school's yeah. at. And um, yeah, man, I was a young kid playing outside, playing kickball, playing, you know what I mean, four square, whatever. And, uh, and, and there was dope fiends walking around in the bike trail and you doing know, their thing. One thing that, as we were driving that we didn't catch on video that we're catching now. Yeah. We had talked about, you know, where you're at in life now. And I want to ask you a serious question, Karen. You know, I see you have a strong connection with your barrio, with your homeboys. I yeah. see it, Karen. You know, especially when you pull up to the parque. Would you ever leave your barrio? I don't see you ever leaving. Can okay, would you leave? Well, you know, everybody who's a everybody who's a part of this lifestyle knows what it is. Yeah. You know it doesn't matter what section you come from you know what i mean it's not this isn't like a this isn't like a bike club it's not a lowrider club it's nothing like that it's like a family yeah and 
You know, when you're a part of a family, that's your family for life. So, you're saying that even though you're doing good now, and you are, you will never leave your neighborhood. That's what you're I'm saying. the family member that's doing good in yeah. the family, you know? Yeah. That's who I am. Um, I'm not I'm not saying that you know the rest of my family members are doing bad I'm, yeah. that's not what I'm saying yeah it's just you know like in a family not everybody goes to college yeah in a family not everybody you know makes music yeah you know in a family you know not everybody does certain things in a family you know we got some family members you know who act the fool we got some family members who you know let, let, let me ask you this question you're doing good now, you know what I'm saying? You're a feat that's proud of you, you're making music, and we're on our way to the studio to, yes, hear, some, to hear some of your amazing music. You're very talented, by the way, Kernan. Thank you, I And we're honored to, to, to be invited to the studio. Um, and I'm only gonna ask you this next question because I really wanna see where you're at. Um, if you saw one of the little youngsters you saw an enemy and they didn't see him. They're, they're, they're slipping. Cause you know, I mean, that's how homeboys die. They get caught slipping all the time. You know, whether they're over here, they're not paying attention. That's one of the things that I always tell youngsters or tell anybody, be aware of your surroundings. You have yeah. to be aware of your surroundings. You know, like when we were walking up and we, your homeboys came up on us, if I was an enemy or if I was somebody, they would've got me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Cause I didn't even see him. I didn't even see him. So they would've caught me right there. And you see one of your little youngsters from, from your barrio. You see an enemy coming, and you know they're gonna take his life. And let's just say, let's just say you, I'm just giving you a scenario, which thank God, yeah, but it's a scenario that could actually happen. It could happen. And you had a strap on you. Would you take another man's life now, today, at the way you're at right now, would you take another man's life to protect one of your little homies? You know, um, that's a serious question. It is. That's a serious question, and God willing, you know, I, I don't ever have to be in that situation. But, you know, I love my family members. Yeah. I love my family. Yeah. You know, and um, I love my brothers. Yeah. And I would never want anything bad to happen to any of them. Yeah. You know, so, uh, I don't know if I could answer the question, the answer you're looking for, but especially because, like, I don't know, you know, you would have to be in that situation. But if you were knowing myself, yeah, I would do whatever I could possible to stop any harm from coming from to my brother. So you would. I wouldn't want to see him get hurt. So you would. That's heavy. You know. And I want to thank you for for being honest. Know, I'm not saying that that's what I'm out there doing. You no, know? yeah, of course not. I'm not yeah, out yeah. there, you know. But in a situation, I would protect my mother. I would protect my sister. I would yeah. protect my brother. Yeah. I would probably even protect an innocent bystander in the right situation. Yeah. If it was the right thing to do. Yeah. You know? Wow. Because, you know, I, I believe in doing the right thing. Yeah. Wow. That's heavy, Konami. Thank you for being honest, and you didn't even truly answer the question, but by not even really doing just the things you were saying, we already got our answer. Well, and thank you for being honest with us here today, Kanam. Us. Right now, we're going to the studio, and this is where the magic happens, you know? Yes, sir. This is, uh, this is where, um, this is where things, you know, take a positive turn, you know? This is where, you know, everything that I showed you so far kind of like not goes away, but I feel like God put me through all of that to put me at right here where I'm at now. Wow. And God knows our hearts. He knows the desires of our hearts. Yeah. And if you know God, you know, and you know Christ, you know that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So um, I feel like God came to me at one of my loneliest and darkest moments in life. And I spoke out to him and he heard me and he spoke back to me. And because of that, you know, I, I, I've been able to live my life now without drugs, without yeah. alcohol. Um, you know, I went back to college. I got a job in construction as an electrician, making decent money. Yeah. And now God has brought me here to do what I love to do because he knows the desires of my heart. That's right. Which is to make music. Yeah. So let's go and check it out. Let's go. 
So right now we just arrived in the studio. This is, as they say, where the magic happens, you know? Yes, sir. This is where the transformation of your life is really starting to uh, take flourish, place. to take place, you yes, know what I'm sir. saying? To be doing music now. We see that you have an amazing producer, right? Yes, sir. Your name, sir? Darren Vegas. Darren Vegas. Darren Give us Vegas. a little bit of your credentials, sir. Uh, Bone Thugs, Lazy Bone, Tupac. Uh, I was a producer at Death Row for years. Wow. In California back in the day. That's like, right. Pretty much everybody from the West Coast at one time or another. And now you're working with this gentleman now? Been working with this homie right here for... Since 2018. 2018. Time flies. That's right, yeah. that's right. Yeah. And we have... Johnny D, the Spanish fly. That's right. Yeah, that's right. The fly, Johnny D. Been doing it since uh, the Poco Spell Logos days, man. And uh, just keeping, keeping it going. What's up, man? It's Johnny D, the Spanish fly. You know what I'm saying? Been doing it for a long time, since the early 2000s. And we're just keeping it going, man. Right here with Lottie the G and everybody else. And Darren Vegas producing. That's the dad's is gonna be on his way. Man, we're we're doing it. Let me let me ask you guys this question. How long have you known this gentleman? Either of you? 2018, when we first started. I knew Lottie for I would say, what about it? A year, a year and a half, two years maybe? Probably two years. Probably two years now. Two years. We've been following each other on social media. Then we For a minute. And yeah. you started working together? Yeah, we started working together. 2021. Since you've known him longer, mm -hmm. and you've already known him by the time that he, he changed his life, you know? Yeah. I don't know how much you know about this gentleman. How much do you know about this gentleman? I know a lot about him, because we, we had a lot of sessions together. We worked on, like, multiple albums. You know that this gentleman right here has been incarcerated in the, in the system for about half his life. Yeah, I definitely know that. And what do you think about the transition from being incarcerated for, you know, a lot, I mean, man, I don't want to say the majority, but at least 50% of his life, and to see what he's doing now, doing something positive. I always tell him, I go, bro, you're like an example. You know yeah. what I mean? Like for the stuff that you went through, yeah. and now how positive he is. Yeah. You know, like he's a hardworking cat. He went out there. He, he got a degree, Yeah. he got a job where he's, he's working, making money, and then he's putting a lot of homies on too. He's bringing people through to me, to the studio. Yeah. All these guys getting them, sometimes breaking them off some money just to give them some chips in their pocket yeah. so they know that he's about his business, you know what I mean? That's right. And um, you can't do nothing but respect that. Exactly, no, m most definitely. Um, same thing with you, Karnai. I know you've been around, you've been around the world in III, but you know, to work with this young gentleman, and I don't know if you knew that he was incarcerated as, as much time that he's done, that he's been down. Um, what would you say the kind of individual that this man is? You know, even though you've only known him for two years, what would, how would you describe this gentleman? Um, he's just a loyal person, bro. Down to earth. Um, just you can tell he changed it. He changed everything around. Yeah. For the, for the benefit. He got a good job, man. Steady. That's right. He's making amazing music, bro, and I'm, I'm glad to be part of Proud of him. everything he does, and I'm proud of him. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. What's up, Johnny? Well, you know what? Um, we're going to get to hear a, a little snippet of his music, you know, um, and uh, see what, what he does in here, you know. And um, this is Body Driven. I'm only 5'9", but the knowledge is big. My shit is realer than real. Your shit is fake like a wig. It really doesn't matter who you know or where you been. I started learning on the streets and graduated from the pen. Now all you pussies watch out, cause I'm back on the outs. Up on game without a doubt, so you know what I'm about. I come from a city where pity don't exist. Red beams on hair triggers, so you know we never miss. Little bitch, shut your lips and open up your eyes. If you caught up in the mix, if you slip, you can die. So right now, um, as we're in the studio, and thank you once again, we have the members of, you know, I mean, man, they, they've been around for a long time, traveled the world, members of Spanish Fly, if you want to give a quick introduction of who you are. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I met the Dazzle Spanish Fly way back, had Soy 18 with a bullet, the album Trust No Man. Shout out to my homeboy, I said Rich Rock, and my boy Trick. So that's a little bit of history of, you know, who we are from the Harbor area, and try to represent it right the best I can do for my gente. That's right. That's what's up. Man, Johnny D, Spanish Fly, you know, Smoker's Paradise, all the jams back in the days in the early 2000s, you know, we're doing it. You know, so we're here with a lot of the G, just That's right. enjoying the breeze. Appreciate you, fellas. Darren Vegas. Oh, what's up? I'm Darren Vegas. You know, just a producer that's been in the industry for my whole life, pretty much. <laughs> now, working with a lot of the 
the new up and coming homies and 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 vet veterans. We're about yeah, to do some right. shit today. Yeah. You yes, know, sir. we we've done a couple songs together, yeah. but I go back to the ruthless days and death row and producing and engineering. So that's right. Yeah. How long have you known Lottie? Lottie the G. I actually met him through Johnny D. Okay. Um, I think they did records together. Right on. And then we did the cruise control record with. I produced that record with Little Rob, my homeboy Little Rob. Right on. Johnny D. On there, and uh, he came to the video. Yes, sir. And what's feeding me about it is always really humble, down yeah. to earth. I appreciate that. Exactly. You, know, you can lose your head. You can get. You can get that King's disease in this game. Yeah, that's but ridiculous. He's very humble. Yeah. Up and comer. And I yeah. love to see the next generation Chicano rappers, are, you know, be successful. Exactly. So I want to be a part of that. And if I could help them in any way, shit, I'm with it. Appreciate much, that. How, how long have you known him? Shit has been what? How many? When we do that record, man? I would say um, about a couple months. A couple months. Yeah, about six months. About six months. Do you, Do you know that he spent half, actually, more than half of his life in prison? I didn't know that actually. Yeah. I didn't know that. His yeah. His brother was murdered in prison. His he was, he's battled, in fact, if, um, this is what the show's about, yeah. you know? Yeah. He's battled uh, addiction to heroin. Um, he, um, he's lived a very, he lived a very brutal life, to be honest with you, okay? You know? And he's been through hell. And so, this is the gentleman that you're working with now. Right. Now that you have a little bit of info on this gentleman, do you look at him different? Nah, man, I still got respect for this guy, but I do have more respect for him. And if I could say something, you know, yes, you talk sir. about like everything you've been through. I've seen it. I've seen it happen with my group, you know, like yeah. I said, Rich Rock, you know, I don't want to go into detail, but yeah. I've seen how like, you know, being in the game, the drugs and all that kind of thing can like get you down and you, yeah. know, and you can lose yourself and, and not find your way back. Yeah. Um, but to see that he was able to get out of that and succeed and still do exactly. it. Hey, mucho respeto, brother. Appreciate and, you know, it, hey, does. I love for that. Like, exactly. And, and, and appreciate and that, know, brother. I want to ask you, you know, and then support everyone here. These guys are legends in the game. That's right. You know, support this this man, you know, and uh, show some love, and you know what I'm saying? Because I'm going to tell you something. Love goes a long way. We'll see you soon. This is lighter, dude. Can I say one more thing, bro? I think this, this would be My important. Bad. Like, Go nah, ahead. nah, it's cool. Because uh, I work with students, like middle school kids. Yeah. And uh, and you you know, you can help the next generations, bro. They see exactly. what you go through. And, you know, they look up to that. Exactly. So, like, sometimes you don't think it's powerful. But they need to see that, too. Like, you come from the negativity or whatever. But you come out on a positive end. Yeah. So, I just wanted to see that. No, most Appreciate definitely. that, brother. And I had shared that with him earlier. I had said something like, you know, it ain't how you start, it's how you finish. Exactly. You right. know? Yeah, that's what's up. Exactly. And that's what we're working on right now. No, for exactly. sure, bro. Yeah. You yep. know, so let your end be great, right now. You know what I'm saying? Continue doing what you're doing. And, uh, all of us, the body dealer, man, we support you. We love Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you everybody that's here. And I appreciate the opportunity and Thank you. for you letting me a be a part of Audio Driven. Nah, the, appreciate it, bro. It's been an honor, honor and a pleasure. It is ours, I appreciate, appreciate you. Bro. No, gracias a ti. Much love to each and every one of you guys. And uh, we're almost closing now, familia. Yeah. Well, once again, Karna, you know what? Uh, I want to thank you, brother. It's been, uh, it's been one hell of a journey to see where you've been in your life. And you know what? I want to tell you, for me, Karna, I'm proud of you, homie. I'm proud of awesome. you, be beyond words, you know? Your brother, your brother was murdered. Your uh, family was, your family was divided, your family fell apart, was torn up. Um, you've had attempts on your life. You spent half your life in prison. And you know what? Today, now today, you're here in the studio. The engineer that you're working with has worked with Death Row Records, Ruthless Records. If that's not success, Karna, I don't know what is. And above all, you have a faith in God. And myself, everyone at Body Driven is beyond proud of you, Karna. Thank you. If there's any last words that you would tell the audience, please do. Just uh, don't ever stop believing in yourself. You know, um, you could do, you could do so many things with your life besides just throw it away. Just Believe in yourself. Don't ever lose hope. Anything is possible. Um, 
where can they find get a hold of you on social media where can they find your clothing line good or made support this man show him some love familia you know we support one another please here please do you know it's not just Vince Romo, Barrio Driven, Mundo, you know what, all these things, no. You know what, we support one another, Rasa, and it doesn't even have to be Rasa, anybody. Please support each and every individual that comes out on this show. Where can they find you on social media and where um, can they get that clothing? You can find me on Instagram. You can find my clothing line on Instagram. It's at Guttermaid. Um, you'll see the spade pop up right away. You'll know it's, it's my, um, my, my page. You could also find my my um, artist page on Instagram at Lottie underscore the underscore G underscore. And uh, you can find me on YouTube at Lottie the G. And um, yeah, I'm on uh, 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 all my music is on uh, digital platforms. You could download my music on all platforms. That's right. Follow this man. If he's got any shows coming up, go out, support him. Watch his music videos. Thank you very much, Ette. We appreciate you. Appreciate you, brother. This is Body Driven. <laughs>